For every genuine thing in this world, everything that is good and powerful, everything that is Uh, if any of you are sports fans, then you recognize this immediately. If uh, whether it's basketball, football, baseball, hockey, field hockey, lacrosse, it doesn't really matter. If some coach comes up with some creative way to score, you can bet that within a few weeks, other coaches are going to be copying that and trying to figure out, oh, how did they do that? I'm going to figure it out, and then I'm going to copy it. Everything that is uh, really successful gets copied, whether it's a best-selling book with another best-selling book that comes after, or it's a movie. I mean, how many dinosaur movies do we need? I don't know. But there's going to be another one, I promise you, because if it's successful, they're going to copy it. And if it's super successful, they're going to copy it again and again and again. In some cases, that's really helpful. For example, scientists created a special, unique formula that, that helped with um, pain and reduced inflammation. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called ibuprofen. And ibuprofen has been copied and copied and copied and copied. And I'm really grateful because now ibuprofen is super inexpensive and it's very effective, right? So some things that are copied are good. For example, um, every house I've ever been in has a kitchen. And I'm grateful for that because kitchens are helpful. So somebody decided cooking indoors is a good idea and then every domicile that's been created around the world pretty much has found a way to cook indoors. And so um, I heard Jason and Talia have to cook outdoors. I apologize for that. That's a very sad thing. But, you know, they'll, they'll finish their remodel in due time. But things that are going well get copied. That's the reality of our life is that things that are going well get copied. But then there are also things, and, and, and that's good, but there are also things that get copied and you think, why are these things being copied? These things shouldn't, shouldn't be copied. And in fact, what we have is so often we have something that is genuine and we have something that is counterfeit. Something genuine and something counterfeit. For example, this morning we worshiped the Lord uh, through singing and there was a genuineness about the worshiping of our God. And the world tries to copy that in a variety of ways. So often people go to a concert and they'll put their hands in the air. That's, like, that's kind of like worship, but instead of worshiping God, it is worshiping an artist who's on stage singing. Or for other people, it's a sporting event. They go to a sporting event. If you've ever been anywhere outside of the United States, what you know is what we call soccer, they call football. And there is a lot of worldwide worship happening at football matches. If you show up at a football match, they will be worshiping. They'll have their hands in the air. They'll be shouting. They'll be singing. They'll be cheering. They'll wear similar kinds of clothing, all sorts of, of ways that they worship their particular team, their favorite athlete, so on and so forth. For everything that's genuine, there's also a copy. Some copies are bad. Some copies are very bad. In recent years, one of the things that we have uh, seen in our society is a thing called deep fake. Deep fake is a copy of an authentic person, video, uh, audio, whatever the case may be. So you could have, uh, very common right now, is deep fake videos where you have a celebrity who is replacing somebody else in, it could be comedic or it could be serious or whatever the case may be. Um, so for example, you might have Jim Carrey's face on top of Jack Nicholson in his role in The Shining. And you look and you go, that doesn't look right. Jim Carrey should not be there. He was not, no, that's not right. And so there are deep fake videos, some of which are funny, some of which are terrible, but some of which are very much just intended to fool people. They're intended to reshape people's opinions. And that's where we get fake news. I also heard about an election in the Northeast where apparently, I'm using quotes here, President Joe Biden robocalled thousands of voters in the Northeast saying, don't worry, Democrats, we got the election sewn up. You don't have to go to the poll. And it was, it was a Joe Biden deep fake that where people were trying to prevent others from going to vote. 
So deep fake is sometimes very serious, and sometimes it can mess with the fundamental things that we hold dear, like our democracy. So there are deep fake things, and they are terrible. But there's also this reality that from the beginning, Satan has been trying to copy the, the authentic the authenticness, if that's a word, of God. And it started way back before, really before creation, where Satan was basically putting himself up and saying, I am like a God. And that's when the Lord was like, no, you're not. Boom. Right? And so we know the story in, in Revelation where the lightning and then he falls to the earth and all those kinds of things. And then he shows up and he's always trying to pretend like he's a God or pretend like he is God or fool people into thinking he's God. And so one of the things he does in, in the book of Revel- uh, Genesis when Eve is, Eve is wrestling about whether or not to take the fruit and, and Satan shows up like a ser- serpent and he tries to pretend like he can speak with the voice of God. Did God really say, don't eat the fruit? Yeah, well, that's it's not really a big deal. In fact, my voice is the authentic voice. You shouldn't remember God's authentic voice. Instead, take my counterfeit voice for your own. And let's say God didn't really say that. And instead, I'm going to tell you, you won't surely die. It won't happen that way. The authentic being replaced by the counterfeit. And this happens all the time in our world where authentic things are, 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 are trying, attempting to capture our minds and hearts. And there are plenty of biblical examples of humans engaging the, in this practice where they have the authentic, but they go for the counterfeit anyway. One of the most famous, of course, is Abraham, who was given a promise from God, you will have a a son, an heir, and Abraham's waiting on the promise, and he's waiting on the promise, and he's waiting on the promise, and he gets tired of waiting on the promise. So instead of following God's plan, the authentic plan, he creates a counterfeit, and he has uh, relations with his wife's handmaiden and and has a, a child, Ishmael, not the son of promise, not the, the genuine thing that God had promised, but an inauthentic thing that God did not promise. And we do this all the time in our own lives. Um, one of the most obvious examples is whenever we are having uh, sexual interaction outside the context of marriage, it is us trying to make an inauthentic thing like the genuine thing that God promised us, that within the context of marriage, there is a beautiful interaction between a husband and a wife, and we don't want that because that's too difficult, or it's too restraining, or it's too restrictive, or, you know, whatever lies the world is telling us in that moment, and instead, we exchange the authentic thing for a counterfeit thing, and the counterfeit, it always leads to destruction in our lives. So, we're going to study uh, this morning in the book of Acts, chapter 8, uh, starting in verse 4, and we're going to read about, um, well, we're going to read about Philip, who's in, in evangelizing in Samaria, but we're also going to read about uh, a man who's affectionately, not affectionately, infamously known as Simon the Sorcerer, so we're going to get to that. But before we do, I just want to kind of catch us up. Where are we at in the story? Once upon a time in Israel, the church had been exploding. Things had been going great. Um, Stephen had been lifted up in leadership. He'd had an interaction that didn't go so well with the leading Jews of the day. They decided that he was being blasphemous, so they They forced him out of the city and they put him to death. They stoned him to death. Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And then after that, a great persecution broke out in all of of Jerusalem. And the persecution drove many of the Jewish Christians out of town. And so they were fleeing persecution and they were going here, there, and everywhere, all over the place, including a man named Philip. So chapter 8 and verse 4. Chapter 8 and verse 4. Now, those who had been forced to scatter went around proclaiming the good news of the word. Philip went down to the main city of Samaria. We don't know which city, by the way. Philip went down to the main city of Samaria and began proclaiming the Christ to them. 
The crowds were paying attention with one mind to what Philip said. And they heard and saw the miraculous signs he was performing for unclean spirits crying out with shrieks were coming out of many who were possessed and many paralyzed and lame people were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now in that city was a man named Simon who had been practicing magic and amazing the people of Samaria claiming to be someone great. All the people from least to the greatest paid close attention to him saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid close attention to him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they But when they believed Philip as he was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they began to be baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after he was baptized, he stayed close to Philip constantly, and when he saw the signs and great miracles that were occurring, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. These two went down and prayed for them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet come upon any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon when he saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, offered them money, saying, Give me this power too, so that everyone I place my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could acquire God's gift with money. You have no share or part in this matter, because your heart is not right before God. Therefore, Repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that perhaps he may forgive you for the intent of your heart. For I see that you are bitterly envious and in bondage to sin. But Simon replied, you pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. So after Peter and John had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem proclaiming the good news to many Samaritan villages as they went. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning again asking for you to be with us. Please be with us in this time. Lord, we recognize that there is no part or or share in you that we can purchase, not by hard work, not by the gift of money, not by any thought we have, but only through our faith in Jesus Christ. And our gift as we believe in you is eternal life with you and being filled with your Holy Spirit. As, as the scriptures tell us, we have become the temple of your spirit. And so we come to you this morning asking again, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us wisdom and insight. I pray that you help us to see truth in this passage that you help us to understand what you're trying to teach us. I pray that you'd be with me, that you would guard my mind and my heart and my mouth, that you would enable me to speak your truth with accuracy and power by your spirit. I pray that you would give all of us ears to hear, a mind to conceive and a heart to believe, that we would believe in you and our faith would grow more and more. We trust in you to do these things because we have asked in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. So the gospel leaves Jerusalem. This is the author, his name is Luke, author's first road trip, so to speak. He's on the road, he's going with Philip, he's seeing this kind of stuff happen. He's been, he's been watching miraculous signs and wonders happen for some time. I don't know if there's ever a time when you watch like somebody who's demons possessed and you watch them freed from demonic possession and you go, yeah, I've seen that before. I don't know. That's, I mean, you know, what's the big deal? Yeah, that guy, he's been begging for 40 years there, but then he got healed and now he's running around, jumping around, but whatever. I don't know. It seems like maybe, no, it's probably not happening. He's probably like, his mind is still being blown over and over again at the power of God being demonstrated 
through the hands of the disciples and seeing miraculous signs and wonders everywhere he goes, it's got to be a, a really exciting time to be alive and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so what we see is they show up, he's there, and um, he and, and Philip, and Philip is setting people free from physical maladies, setting them free from demonic oppression. And then the most important thing, he's sharing the gospel, which is setting them free from a eternity in their sin, an eternity um, without God, an eternity in hell. He's, he's sharing the gospel with them. And people are being set free physically, spiritually, emotionally. They're being set free in every kind of way. And the gospel is exploding and people are excited and there's amazing stuff happening. And it's happening where? In Samaria. So you may remember Samaria. Samaria is a region within Israel where there was a group of people who kind of broke off from the northern kingdom of Israel during the divided kingdom time, once upon a time, a long time ago. And that group of people sort of rejected or, and was rejected by Jerusalem, the, the, the true Jews, I think they would have called themselves. And this group of uh, people in Samaria then also intermarried with other peoples. And so they were, they were like the, the ugly cousin. They were like the, the, I don't know how to just, they were the black sheep, if that makes sense, the black sheep of the family, so to speak. And even early in Jesus' ministry, he says to the disciples, hey, let's go up to this northern part of, of the country. And they're like, okay, well, we'll have to take this um, eastern road so we can go around Samaria because Samaria is between where Jesus was and where he wanted to go. And Jesus is like, well, let's go through Samaria. And the disciples are like, what? No, why would you go there? That's terrible there. There's a terrible place there. Terrible people there. Everything's bad there. Why would you go there? And they end up going there, and Jesus meets the woman at the well in Samaria. And that's one of the stories that, that where Jesus has this heart to re, not only redeem the Samaritans, but also to redeem the image, uh, the mental image of the rest of the Israelites and their understanding of who Samaria is. The other, the other way that he did that was, of course, he told the, the, the famous story he was asked, who is my neighbor? Right? Remember this story? And Jesus tells the story of the, the traveler, and the traveler is beaten to a pulp, and then, you know, uh, a priest goes by, and he's like, you know, may God bless you, but I'm going to walk on the other side of the street. And, and then a Levite goes by, and he's like, oh, I don't have time. I'm in such a hurry. I can't really help you. And then a Samaritan shows up and helps a man and takes him to the village and pays for his room and helps him get healed up, right? And Jesus is trying to say... Samaritans are good too. They're just people. And he's reshaping the mental image of what a Samaritan is in all these Jewish minds. And now, here we are, all these 2,000 years later, and many places still have what's called a good Samaritan law on their books. So, you can look that up later. But there you go. So, they're in Samaria. And all this amazing stuff is happening, and we see evangelism is happening, and people are being set free from all kinds of maladies and things. People are believing and are being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And what happens is the ministry is now expanding at such a rate and in so many places that the original 12, the apostles, have now sort of taken their hands off direct ministry and their role has shifted to a supervisory role, if you will. They might be more thought of as uh, regional supervisors, I don't know. Um, and, and so they're watching and hearing what's happening as the gospel is spreading to all of these villages and towns and places and other nations. And the apostles are now have this role of verifying what is happening. So you see this a few different times in the book of Acts, and in this case, uh, they hear, the apostles hear that something great is happening in Samaria, and so they dispatch Peter and John, whom we've <laughs> had so much of the story of Acts is about Peter and John. So they show up, and they do extraordinary, they, first of all, they're like, yes, 
We verify that this is absolutely a work of God, and we're all for it. Good job, Philip. They probably gave him a high five or something. And then, they're, then they get into the work. Like they start praying with people, and they start recognizing, oh, wait, the Holy Spirit is um, uh, here but not here, and what's going on with all of that? And so now we pause for a moment, and we talk about the unholy controversy, <laughs> the unholy controversy of the Holy Spirit. And so there are individuals who check this passage out, individuals and churches and denominations who check this out, and some who say, when Peter and John showed up, the Holy Spirit wasn't there. I mean, He was there, but He wasn't there, right? Isn't that what we see when we read this passage? That um, uh, Starting in verse 14, let's just read it. Now, the apostles in Jerusalem heard that that Samaria had accepted the word of God and they sent Peter and John to them. These two went down and prayed for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 16, for the Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on the Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use two words that, that I used right at the beginning when we began talking about the book of Acts, okay? There are two ways to interpret this. One is descriptive. Here is Luke recording what happened. He's describing what he is seeing and hearing. He's doing interviews and verifying, oh, this person said this, and this person said this, and this is what happened, and he's dutifully recording it. He is describing an event. The second way to look at this is, this is prescriptive. This is the way that God wants ministry done. And whenever you show up in a place and you make disciples, first you make disciples of Jesus Christ, they come to faith, they are baptized, and then later you place your hands on them and pray that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And so there are two different ideas about how this goes down. One is, this is a description of what happened in that place and time. The other is, this is the way we should always do it. Okay, and so maybe you've heard this before and maybe you haven't, but this particular unholy controversy has caused all manner of division in the church. And so one of the things that I want to start with is this, we are united. We are united church. And so when we look at these passages, we can have agreements, we can have disagreements, we can have discussions, but we are not going to divide. We are United Church. The next thing I want to say about this is that um, this particular passage has been used to tear apart one person from another, to tear apart a church, to tear apart one denomination from another. And in some cases, it can be helpful for churches to have different distinctives. And so we have churches in Klamath Falls that believe that this is prescriptive, and we love them, and we support them, and we encourage them, and we just disagree on what this means. And so, there are other churches in, in the basin that we love and support and encourage that believe that this is prescriptive, that once a person is saved and is baptized, then the next thing that needs to happen is that somebody with the authority of the Holy Spirit lays hands on them and prays that the Holy Spirit come upon them, and then there would be an expectation of evidence that the Spirit came, for example, the speaking in tongues or other kinds of spiritual giftings, okay? And so they believe that, and, and we don't hold to that belief, but there are probably people in this room that do hold to that belief, and that's okay. You're welcome here. We love you, and we're glad you're with us. So if you want to talk about this more, if you want to get into this and understand the nitty-gritty of this, please send me an email, and we'll schedule a time, and we can sit down and talk about it. But I'm not going to take a whole bunch more time this morning, okay? Thank you, whoever said that. God bless you. Okay, so prescriptive and descriptive and then um, Pentecostal friends. <laughs> I have Pentecostal friends, friends of mine that are dear to me that still believe this is de- um, prescriptive, but I don't. So there you go. Okay, so now we get on to Simon. 
So here's what comes next. Now, verse 18. Simon, when he saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, offered them money, saying, Give me this power, too, so that everyone I place my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. So, this is a very interesting passage, this conversation that Simon is having with Peter. And what we see is that Simon is out of line. Simon is out of line for two reasons. First, he's out of line because he thinks he can purchase the power of God. And, and that is inconsistent with who our God is. Our God has never been one who says, oh yeah, for $49.99, I will give you the power to cast out demons. Come on down. Order here. Like, that's not our God. And that's never been our God. Amen? Hey, better. Okay, so, uh, so, so he was out of line there, but also he just completely misunderstands how, what's important. He, he's misunderstanding what's important here. What Simon is fixated on is the power. He wants the power. He wants the authority, and it makes sense if you think about his background. Simon has been wandering around town performing magic, and people think he's great. He's the great power. And so he had probably an ego the size of Alberta, Canada. Like, it would have been significant, his, his ego, and he was trying to say, okay, well, now I've come to faith in this God, this Jesus, and I'm okay with that, but I still want to be able to do things that are cool, that are unique to me. And I see these two guys have a special thing. I want some of that. So his, his perspective was wrong. His perspective was wrong. And so what we see next is flabbergasting. Peter rebukes him intensely. If you look at this, the rebuke is, what's the right word for this? It is significant. It is powerful. It is intense. It is unflinching. His rebuke is, is strong. Let me show you what I mean. Verse 18, now, now Simon, when he saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, offered money saying, give me this power too, so that everyone I place my hands on will receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter says to him, may your silver perish with you. Those who are in Christ Jesus never perish, right? We die only to live again. That's, that's how we see life. Our life it comes to an end in the physical body, but we live again immediately in the spirit. Like, and Peter knew that. He is not here saying, you know, when you die and your cash dies and you go to heaven, your cash is going to stay behind. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, your faith that you claim to have is worthless, and you are still in your sin, and you have no part in salvation. That's the rebuke. That's the rebuke. The notes in the net say this, may your silver together with you be sent to destruction. A different way of translating the same passage. May your silver along with you be sent to destruction. This is a serious rebuke. This is a heavy-duty rebuke. He may as well have said, Simon, you're not saved. You're not. You think you know Jesus, but you don't. And you have no part in salvation. You have no part in this. You have no part in this. The word, uh, the word there is actually logos. You have no part in this. It could be translated this thing. It could be translated this ministry. Or it could be translated logos actually directly translates to word. It could be you have no part in the word of God. No part of the word of God has entered into you, nor you into God's word. You have no part in this. 
That would have been enough, but he doesn't stop there. You have no part in this matter because your heart is not right before God. Peter explains when he says, you have no part in this. What I mean to say is your heart is not right before God. I don't know how, this is one of those, uh, how does Peter have a sense within him that he gets to say that to this man? Who can judge the heart of another man? Only the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit at work in Peter that authorizes him to say what he has said. So Peter says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have no share, no part in this matter is is yours because your heart is not right before God. And this next sentence ought to make us tremble just a little bit because look what he says next in verse 24. Or 22. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that he may perhaps forgive you for the intent of your heart. As I was studying, I, I, I remember reading this and th- it, like, it takes your breath away. Haven't we always been taught from the time we were little in Christ? You, can, you can't do anything that's going to that's gonna affect your relationship with God. He always forgives you. He always loves you. He's always with you. He always takes care of you. And here, Peter, who walked with Jesus and is a pillar of the church, he says, repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord and perhaps he will forgive you. He will forgive the intent of your heart. There's like a little question mark there from Peter, isn't it? A little like subtle, you might have done just a little too much. You might have gone too far. So what does this mean and and what doesn't this mean? So here's here's my opinion, okay? This isn't an indication of whether or not God is willing to forgive. It's not an indication of whether God is willing to forgive. I'll say it one more time. This isn't an indication of whether or not God is willing to forgive. God's always willing to forgive. This is an indication about whether or not Simon has it in him to truly repent. Is Simon actually able to repent? Is he actually able to turn? Like you guys remember that there are many definitions to repent, but one of them is, I was heading in this direction and now I'm turning. This is repentance. I was going this way, and I'm turning, and I'm going the other direction. I used to be walking away from God, and I have turned so I can walk toward Him. And and Peter is saying, do you have what's in you to turn away from your wicked ways and return to the Lord? I don't know. I don't know. We We don't talk like this, do we? We don't talk like this. We don't talk like this. God help us. Therefore, verse 22, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that perhaps he may perhaps forgive you for the intent of your heart. It would have been enough. That's enough, Peter. Stop. Peter's like, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Verse 23, for I see that you are bitterly envious and in bondage to sin. Bitterly envious. Oh, that definitely speaks directly to this whole, um, I want to buy the Holy Spirit. Can I just buy the Holy Spirit? It's not about the Holy Spirit, right? That's not about the Holy Spirit. That's about the power. That's about the authority. That's about the ability. That's about His ego. I want to be able to do cool things. So I'm going to give you money so that I can have the power to do cool things. And Peter is saying, God forbid you have bitterness and envy in your heart and you are in bondage to sin. I I mean, if I had been there, if that had been me, if I was in Simon's shoes, like I'd be a puddle on the floor. I mean... Peter just wails on him. 
again and again and again. I, I, like, it's mind-blowing. How much more can Simon take before he just completely crumples into a pile of dust? Bitter envy, bondage to sin, bondage to sin. When I, when I read that, uh, it made me think of Romans chapter 6. So let's put that on the screen. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Are we to remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or don't you know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Paul talks about bondage to sin. Read Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. Paul talks about bondage to sin. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we are no longer slaves to sin because we die to sin. It's part of the symbolism of baptism that we are dead, buried, and resurrected in Christ and so we are no longer bond, in bondage to sin. We're not slaves to sin any longer. We still continue sinning, like there's no doubt, right? We still break our oaths and we still do things and say things we ought not do and say. There are things we should do that we don't do and we know it. But we're not bondage to sin any longer. For those who are in Christ Jesus, we're not in bondage to sin. This is just another argument that Peter is saying, you don't know Jesus. You say you do, but you don't. So how does Simon respond? <laughs> well, from his knees, probably. I don't know. Like, that would have been enough to put me on the ground. But here, Simon is, here's Simon, and, and this is one of those things that I, I like, if I, if I was writing this story, I would have been like, and so Simon responded, begging God to forgive him and pleading with, with Peter, teach me God's ways and show me the way forward and help me to know him so that I can repent and so that I can overcome and I can change and I can turn and all these things come into my head and, and, and what does Simon say? You pray to the Lord that he might forgive me. You pray so that none of what you would say will happen to me. He doesn't even take responsibility. Never does he say, you're right, I, I was, I, 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 my, my, my mind was wrong, my spirit was wrong, my heart was wrong, I was seeking the wrong thing. He never repents of anything. He just like, oh, well, that sounds terrible. Pray that God will fix it for me. He doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. I don't understand. I don't know. How does he, how can he... Here's the, the truth of the matter. I know people like this. And you probably do too. It reminds me of the, the parable of the sower and the seed. Like, the sower scatters seed. And some of it falls on the good ground and it grows up and it yields a big crop. But some of it grows in all these other places. Some of it lands on the path and the birds come. Satan comes and steals away the gospel. Some of it lands in the rocks and it shoots up real fast. And then the sun comes, but it doesn't have any roots, so it withers and it dies. And some of it grows up in the weeds and the weeds choke it out and it dies. And here Simon is, he grew up real fast and he, got, uh, uh, he had faith and he was baptized. And then his heart was wrong and his mind was wrong. And he never really understood. He never really understood. I know people like this. I know people like this, and you probably do too. And if you read this the way I do, it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. Knowing that there are people who, who grew up and said, Oh, I, I love the Lord. I was baptized when I was six. And I've, I follow him, mostly when it's convenient, when I feel like it, at Christmas and Easter. In conclusion, the first thing I want to say is this. 
Church, we should continually be examining our own selves. Continually examining our own selves. On the one hand, I believe every one of us has the right, has, has the, the, the opportunity to have confidence in our faith. Our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The, his requirements never change. And if we are in Him, then we are secure, and we can have confidence in that and know that we are secure in Christ. Amen? But we should also always be examining ourselves. Philippians 2.12. So then, dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, continue working out your salvation with awe and reverence. Or some of the other translations say, fear and trembling. Always going back to the Lord. Always going back to the Lord. Always going back to the Lord. I was listening to a cool audio Bible, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's got some like hip-hop music in the background and scrip- scripture being written. You wouldn't like it at all. Um, so anyway, I was listening to this audio Bible, and I was scrolling, I've been scrolling through, and I'm like, in the last few weeks, I've done two-thirds of the New Testament. And it went through James, and it was this, it's this very cool reminder when you get through big chunks of Scripture, how, how Scripture is tightly interconnected. And I was in James, and, and like James 3, he basically jumps up and down, James does, in his letter. And he says, oh yeah, you all say you have faith. I'll show you by my deeds. I'll show you by my actions. You won't have to wonder whether or not I have faith because you can examine my life and see it. Some people say they have faith, but they don't have any proof. And we know what Jesus said is, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Many people think that they're okay, but their faith is counterfeit. It's not authentic. It's counterfeit. This is a... Uh, this next verse I, I quoted a lot because it terrifies me and I want to continually have the fear of the Lord in my mind and in my heart. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. And Jesus says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and, 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 and do many powerful deeds? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you lawbreakers. It breaks your heart. It breaks my heart people who think that they're right with God and they're not. As we get to the end of this, I think about one of the big lessons that I learned here. Peter shows love. Do you guys see that? In this rebuke, Peter shows love. It would be unloving for Peter to say, Simon, you're in trouble. You better figure that out and walk away. But that's not what he does. Peter speaks the truth again and again and again. And the reality is that the truth in love isn't always gentle. And it is, I understand, it is is a, a, a fine walk to walk between being kind and loving versus being unloving but nice. It's a fine line, and I get that. And there are times when we need to be able to speak the truth to people and know it's going to hurt them. It's going to hurt them. But sometimes... Sometimes the, the least loving thing you can do is let someone go on in their sin. It is unloving to let people go on in their sin. It is unloving to smile and nod. 
Loving is truth. And it isn't always gentle. And if you ever wonder, hmm, I think Peter blew it here. He probably did it wrong. You should talk to the Spirit about that. Because I don't think so. I think he did exactly what the Holy Spirit wanted him to do. And it was intense. And Simon would have been crushed under it if he knew what Peter was saying. Sometimes the truth in love is not gentle. When we want people to come to repentance, we can't, we can't pretend that they're okay. <sighs> okay, let's pray. Father God, we, we come to you in humility. We come to you with open hearts, asking that you continually shape us into the image of your son, Jesus Christ, asking that you would continually give us strength and courage so that we could walk in obedience to you, asking that you would give us wisdom and discernment and insight so that we can be your ambassadors in this place, not just here in this place in this church, but here in this town, here in this world. This morning I pray, help us to, first of all, fall at your feet, begging for, for forgiveness of our sin, begging for you to cleanse us and wash us anew, begging for you to fill us with your spirit, helping us to become like you, Lord. I pray that you would help us, help us to walk in humility before you, always repenting, always turning back to you, always asking for your direction. Pray you also help us, Lord. Give us discernment so that we might recognize what's happening in the lives of the people that we interact with. In this story, we don't see where, where Peter and Simon are friends. We just see where the Holy Spirit speaks through the apostle to the man who thought he was right. Lord, I don't know how this should go with us. I just know we need your wisdom. We need your strength. We need your insight. Help us to be wise and discerning. Help us to love people in, a, in an extraordinary way. And when it's necessary, help us to speak truth in love. To speak truth in love. Sometimes that's not gentle, Lord. We know that. But give us the strength to do it anyway. Father in heaven, we love you, we worship you, we give you all honor and praise. We give you thanks that your word is like a two-edged sword, that it cuts bone and marrow, spirit and soul. Help us to fall on your word again and again to remember who you are and what you've called us to. Be with us this morning. Be with us, I pray. We worship you. And we ask all of these things in the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. And all of God's children said, amen. Amen. Church, I love you very much. Um, and, and my heart is for you. And, and if you need help in this, if you, want, um, if you want some kind of sounding board or whatever, I'm here for you. I want to be an encouragement to you. I want to... I wanna, be a part of the, the work of the Holy Spirit to be a blessing to you. And uh, so, before I say you're dismissed, I want to say one more thing. Um, there are hot dogs being cooked out that door. <laughs> and if you want a hot dog, go and grab a hot dog. God bless you. You are dismissed. <laughs>